1621, the Plymouth colonists were thankful to God and they celebrated his blessings with the Wampanoag Indians. That same year... Yeah, what about them? <laughs> I'm sure they'll get out on their own whether I say it or not. <laughs> but children, you can go on to children's worship. <laughs> Remy's coming up here to be with me. Kids, Thanksgiving Day started because the people, the pilgrims, the colonists wanted to thank God. All right. In, eight, in 1865, Abraham Lincoln proclaimed a year of national observance of Thanksgiving. In fact, throughout his presidency, he said every year he proclaimed a national day of thanksgiving. In that proclamation, he said something, he said this, I do therefore invite my fellow citizens to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father. He did that when? In the middle of the Civil War. He said, let's give thanks. At the end of the Civil War, he said, we as a nation need to give who? God thanks. Numerous presidents throughout history. And in, I believe it was 1941, when our nation said, we are going to make it a national holiday, the fourth Thursday of November, where we are going to give God thanks. In this environment in which we want to be um, politically correct, in which oftentimes, and in fact, uh, cases continue to go before our Supreme Court to try to eliminate things that are religious, the fact is, is that we as a nation need to give God thanks. Throughout this month, we're going to be focusing on a theme verse for the month. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, God said, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of the Lord for you. By the way, that is not just an invitation. It's a command. It's an instruction that God says, Look, do this in every circumstance, no matter what you're going through. And what does... Every circumstance, that means, okay, you're like, you got it last week, right? It means every situation, every circumstance. Now, does that mean that therefore, no matter what's happening, we say, thank you, God, because my car just exploded. It says in the middle of that circumstance, no matter what you're facing, you might be facing a physical trial, you might be facing something, something personal, a relationship issue that's hurting, a family that's breaking up, some other kind of difficult thing. In the middle of that, it's not saying, oh, thank you, God, for this bad thing. But in the middle of this thing, God, I thank you. I thank you that you're here with me. I thank you that I'm not alone. I thank you that I can face this knowing that your strength is going to be there and available for me. To give thanks in all circumstances. No, it doesn't say, give thanks for everything bad that happens. I just stubbed my toe. Oh, thank you, God, that felt good. No, it's not that's what you do. But in the middle of whatever you are facing, you are giving God thanks. You're acknowledging that God is greater even than the circumstance, the difficulty, the pain, the heartache, the frustration that you are facing. And so you're putting him in his rightful place and you are giving him thanks. So our text for this, this week is Psalm 100, verses 1 to 5. And in the opening, the introduction of that psalm, it says, a psalm for giving grateful praise. What, by the way, what is psalms? It's the hymn book for Israel. It's the song book for Israel. And so the, the people would sing these songs. And this is one that they sang. It's, it's, and it starts out with, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Give thanks and praise God, the psalmist says. 
And he says we're actually to enter into the place where God is, where the, the sanctuary where God is worshiped. We, we enter with thanksgiving. Now notice, this is an expression that's supposed to happen with joy. Thank you. Thank you, God. Right. Have you ever noticed some of us when we're saying thanks to God, like, you know, you know really? Are you really thankful? Or you're kind of like, you're, you look miserable. <laughs> Give thanks to God. It should express itself with joy. There should be this attitude of gratefulness. And, and it's open and it's out loud. Praise God. There should be a <laughs> sense, sense of, I'm not keeping it inside. Then think about it. Now, when a child gets a gift at Christmas time that they really like, have you seen some of those commercials that are already out? Little kids, they're opening presents, and, and they're like, wow, their eyes are open, yay! And they're all excited, right? Okay, we need to have some of that same kind of excitement. When Houston won the, the um, World Series, what happened to the people of Houston? Oh, they got real quiet, and they allowed the noise to come from Los Angeles, right? They celebrated. They, re they were noisy about their praise and their thanksgiving. And gratitude ought to come from a joyful heart expressed openly. It comes to God with, with thanksgiving and praises. And, and we, too, we need to come to worship even when we don't feel like it. In fact, we need to come to worship, especially when we don't feel like it. When we feel broken and lonely and hurting and, and, and in pain, when we actually go, I'm depressed, I'm discouraged, I'm, I'm just in a bad place, that's not the time to stay away from worship, but that's the time to enter with thanksgiving and to come in with praise and to get into the presence of God and allow our feelings, because our feelings are fickle, folks, to allow our feelings to get changed by coming into his presence. Enter with thanksgiving. Come in with praise. We need to let thanks move us into worship and the praise of God to take us into his sanctuary. We need to come and be in worship for God. We need to bless him, praise him, ascribe honor to him, acknowledge him as God, worship him. How does it say it? He says, worship. I'm wiggling. Worship with loud songs, with joyful songs. Ask yourself, when you're singing, and some of you, do you have, some of you have a monotone? <laughs> Daryl's got his hand up like that. So, some of us, some people don't sing well. Sometimes I have people come up to me after I've led a song somewhere out in public and say, oh, you have such a good voice. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I can't, I can't take credit for that. I got the voice that God gave me, right? And so do you. You have a voice that God gave you. And you might be like my eldest son who is a monotone, who keeps wondering, Dad, how come you can sing and I can't? And yet, Tim, did you know what Tim did in his youth group? He led worship in his youth group with a guitar that he taught himself in trying to teach them to praise God. You don't even have, you can even be monotone, folks, and worship and praise God. Maybe that's why the psalmist in another place said, worship him with a, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, right? So if you don't have a song, a melodious voice, then praise God, you get to do it with a joyful noise, right? And use your noise to praise him. Do our songs, does our worship, does it acknowledge the joy of the Lord? And by the way, again, I need to remind you that this psalm is, is, song is a command, not an invitation. An instruction to God's people, do this, worship with joyful songs. Let people hear it. Let people see it. Let people know that you mean it. Praise ought to be something that is evident to other people. If somebody has come up to you and they've just had something really good happen to you, can you tell it before they even get to talk to you? If they've got really good news, or, or, or when the Astros won the World Series, did you see what happened to the, to the players on the field? 
They erupted in praise. The Dodgers had already left, but, but they erupted in praise, right? And, and you can't hold it back. They're jumping on each other. They're acting like little kids. The same thing happens in, in football games and other athletic events where people, you've watched it this weekend, various teams as they would get a touchdown there, they're jumping up and down, they're celebrating, they're hugging one another, they're hugging friends and people and neighbors that you don't even know. And there's all kinds of other reasons for that too, but we'll not go into there. <laughs> But there's an exuberant response to something that people appreciate. And shouldn't there be that in the church? People should hear it. Praise is something that ought to be spoken out loud. People should see it. They should recognize it on our face. Did you see Ben this morning? <laughs> we were commenting, weren't we? <laughs> Did you see Ben this morning? Is he standing up there worshiping? He wasn't looking like this. He had a smile on his face, like he does right now. <laughs> he had a smile on his face. It was, it was evident that, that Ben was up there to celebrate God, to enjoy him, to praise him. And that's what ought to happen to all of us. And it shouldn't be because somebody says, smile. Okay? You, you know, you can't, you can't tell people in worship, okay, y'all need to smile. Especially it's hard to tell people to smile when the song is just saying, Oh, well, what a wretch I am. Okay, you don't really, really smile when you think about yourself being a wretch, do you? But, but there ought to be something that happens in worship and praise in which our minds, our faces, our bodies express outwardly and openly for others to know it that we celebrate our God. What William Barrick said, we must serve and worship our great God. How? With joy. Only those who acknowledge his deity can offer acceptable praise and service. Gratitude and thanksgiving must abound in our worship. It ought to be at the core of everything that we're doing when we're here together. We need to praise God and don't wait until you feel like it. Well, I don't feel happy today, so I'm not going to praise him. No! When you don't feel like praising him is the time you need to do it most. When you don't feel thankful is the time you need to thank God most. When the emotions aren't there, when it's not about something that's erupting inside of you, but you recognize to the core of you there is something worthy of praise that is bigger than you, praise God. And what does he go on to say? He says, shout for joy to the Lord. Psalm 47, 1 to 2, clap your hands, all you nations. And by the way, it doesn't say you have to clap in rhythm, does it? <laughs> clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy, for the Lord Most High is awesome, the great king over all the earth. Do you know what would happen when a king would go out and fight a battle and the, the army would fight with and there'd be victory out on the battlefield? Do you know what they would do? They would send a herald back to the town to say, victory, we've won! Get ready, the king's going to return. And what would happen? The, the people would all gather in the streets. Those of you can watch back to World War II and you remember when, when D-Day came and, and there was victory. And what happened? The people gathered on the streets to celebrate. There needs to be that kind of outspoken, loud response simply because of the God that we serve. There was shouting, cheering in the streets when the king came to town to celebrate victory. And I ask you, do we shout? Do we celebrate like they do and will today after an NFL game? There's a whole part of our culture that is um, fixated on media and technology and music. And a part of, part of that is what takes place at raves where thousands will gather, sometimes 50 to 70,000 kids and young people will gather with technicolor screens and all, lights all over. Oh, you weren't supposed to put it up yet. <clears throat> at the end of a rave in 2015, <laughs> <laughs> At the end of a rave in 2015, Colin, Colleen Myers shared a prayer request after a conversation she had with the main photographer for the rave. 
this young man actually is paid to take pictures of raves. Uh, he has his, his own, David has his own uh, photography studio and website where he promotes his p promo pictures. And, and she was speaking with this young man and he came up to her as a, and in their discussions they were talking about the pictures and, and they were by the, some kind of a bubble machine the, the moms were that hugged the, the kids at raves and, and he said I want to take your picture here in front of the bubbles because it looks so really cool you know bubbles coming out and you guys hugging people and all and, and, and then they get, kept conversing he was exuberant and excited when he said what we see here what we are seeing here is a movement to form the modern church This is church. Isn't it great that they are including Jesus among all the other demonic things here? Now the picture. And he pulled out his camera and he showed her this picture that he had just taken. This is at Euphoria 2015. And, and, and Jamie said... Wow, this is so exciting. In fact, let me read on from what the conversation. He explained that the other images that were flashed on the screen were from other religions and demonic stuff. I thought about what we saw inside the rave Friday night, a huge globe and lit images of the Alpha and Omega and the Egyptian fertility signs surrounded with chairs where people could down people in chairs where people can incantations from the stage, hands raised in worship of the music, artists painting dark demonic images as an act of worship during the music, etc. This is what this is just what Colleen and the ladies were observing. They weren't in there the whole time. Jamie said that all of these beliefs are now coming together in unity, and this is the new church. He said, we're so happy about that. This is not your stereotypical new age hippie guy. This was a very clean cut, sober, all American businessman. I was compelled to speak the truth to him about Jesus being the only way to God. The look he gave me was chilling to me as well. He wasn't mad or argumentative. It was like I was telling him something that he'd just plain forgotten. I don't know how much longer we will be able to freely go about ministering like we do now at these raves. Time is short for sure. The new church is forming. This is a call to you and our precious prayer warrior partners. We need to wake up the church. We are losing this generation. I am so shaken up by what I've seen here this weekend. Please pray against this bold move of the enemy against our youth. Please pray for an army of prayer warriors and laborers that will go to speak truth in love to this generation. Please pray that our churches would stand against the enemy's lies and be faithful. God, help us. A generation is learning to praise. There was a video that I saw of an event in the Netherlands, 2006. Continues every year. It's a similar event like this, a rave. It starts out with a kind of almost, a, well, it's a 3D image of a face of a demon. And the whole thing begins with, um, you are here, you have been brought here and you are going to be controlled by this experience tonight and everyone has an evil part in them, a bad part in them and it goes on and on like this and then it shows pictures as, as, as you're seeing this video, you're watching as the kids and what are the kids doing as they're saying this? They're starting to cheer. They're shouting for joy. They're celebrating. What are they doing? They're worshiping and shouldn't, shouldn't the church worship with more enthusiasm. The psalmist goes on and says, all the earth should praise God. Albert Barnes said, the, the nations, the people of the earth are one. However much they may differ in complexion, in language, in customs, in religion, they have all been formed by the same God. They are all one family. They are all entitled to the same privileges that they may all have the same access to his throne. The races of people are one and all should gather around the throne of their common creator and render him united praise. Yahweh is God, the psalmist says. God has made us. We're not self-created. In fact, we are his people, he goes on. 
We belong to God simply because he created us. And here's the good news. Not only did he create us, but he continues to recreate us. Or the word we might use, he redeems us. Titus 2.14, Paul says, who gave himself, speaking of God, he says, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Jesus Christ, by his own actions, has made it possible for us to be redeemed. Revelation says it this way, that he purchased us off the auction block like a slave. We're standing there on the auction block and Jesus purchased us. And that's the word they use in Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. All people are being redeemed if they'll accept it. In, in Galatians 4, 5, the, the verse is, shout because Jesus paid the price to take us off the market. We're no longer on the market out there, Galatians 4. But when the time, the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. We're no longer out there in the marketplace. We've been bought with a price, and that price was the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And we should shout because Jesus paid for each one of us and set us free. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But how were you bought? With the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Folks, we should be shouting. And we shout because we're his people, because he purchased us, he paid the price, he redeemed us, he sets us free, and now because of that, we are his sheep. God is our shepherd. And the great psalm says it so well. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I'm reading from the NIV, which is going to be different than some of us have memorized it. But he says, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the paths for his name's sake, even though I walk through the, val the darkest valley. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our shepherd, look at what he does to us. God, our shepherd, he says, we're gonna lack nothing. God's gonna take care of all of our needs. It doesn't mean he's gonna give us everything we want, does it? but he's going to take care of what we need. He takes us into green pastures. We're, we're sheep, and, and we have to move around or we'll destroy a piece of property and the, the, the grass that's there. And so we need to be taken to green pastures, to fresh pastures. Says, Otherwise, we're not going to eat at all. He, he leads us to quiet waters. Sheep won't drink from fast-moving water. It needs to be slow and, and something that they can handle. And, and we, too, we need those quiet waters where, where then, what, is, what does the shepherd do for us? That's where he refreshes us. He refreshes us and, and because he knows that we need rest, and so he restores us, and he guides us. The shepherd has to guide the sheep. Sheep can't find food on their own. You, you know it by now, don't you? Sheep are dumb. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. The, sh the shepherd comes and, and is present with us, and he's present with us in the worst of situations, in the darkest of moments. God is there with us. In fact, you don't have to ask, God, please be with me. Maybe what we should do is change that prayer from God, please be with me, to God, help me to recognize that you are with me. 
God, help me to know that you are with me because you've already promised to be with me, to never leave me. You've said that you're going to be there, especially in those dark valleys. You've already said you're not leaving. So God, I need the eyes to see. I need the heart to feel and to know and understand that you are with me. I no longer have to play. Please, God, come be with us because God's already said, I'm here. I am with you. And the shepherd is with us. And the shepherd comes to comfort us. Now notice the shepherd lies down with his sheep. The shepherd knows the sheep. The shepherd cares about the sheep. The shepherd loves the sheep so much that he'll use his rod to sometimes discipline them. He'll actually call them back out of trouble. He may rescue them with that rod and that staff because they're tools used by a shepherd who really cares and doesn't want to allow the sheep to die. And by that, he also protects from our enemies. Sheep, they need a shepherd. They can't protect themselves. The only defense they have, frankly, is to stay together with other sheep. Oh, yes, that's another message, isn't it? The need that we have to be with the shepherd and the other sheep because when we're out there by ourselves, that's when the wolves attack. Shepherds help us heal. They actually anoint the sheep with literally with oil. When bugs are trying to bother the sheep, they will put oil on them so that the bugs can't bother them and create sores and all. The shepherd heals and protects from insects. The shepherd is good, good, kind to the sheep. The shepherd knows so much about the sheep that he's named them and knows them by name. And the shepherd loves the sheep. You can tell the difference between, Jesus described this, you can tell the difference between a hired hand who's just paid to take care of the sheep and the shepherd who knows and loves the sheep. And the shepherd is the only one who can provide eternal life for the sheep. And those are the promises of Psalm 23. But they're also found in the New Testament as well. John 10, in just a couple of verses there, what does Jesus say? I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And goes on in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. That's the good shepherd, Jesus Christ, who's laying his life down for us. Alan Carr said, if we ever grasp the truth that the Lord is our shepherd, my shepherd. It would forever transform us. We would realize that we never have to worry about a need being met. We never have to fear anything that arises in life. We're, we are his promise and his guarantee that all is in his control. It's the statement from Romans 8 that God is going to work all things together for good for those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. Do you get it? Do you understand what it means to have a good shepherd? And is he your good shepherd? question why should we thank God it's not because he needs our thanks and praise it's not because he needs to be somehow built up before we let him down to criticize him it's like when you go to I was reading about this with the millennials recently you've got to praise millennials if they're going to work for you you've got to spend significant time in fact it's like 10 times as much praise. So if you're going to do an evaluation, you sit down in the evaluation and you've got to come up with, you know, nine things that you're going to praise them for, especially if you have one thing that you want them to improve. Now, you can't do more than one because they'll get upset by it. Now, and now are we, are we overgeneralizing? I hope not. <laughs> but, but the challenge is when we, have, we are being taught in all different kinds of ways that if you're going to tell somebody something that they're not doing well, you've got to do a whole bunch more of telling them something good. But doesn't that happen in marriage too? Sometimes spouses think it's their job to fix their spouse. And, and if you're taking a lot of time to fix your spouse, I gotta, I'm going to tell you they're not going to like it. But that praise and love... Um, this, this week I went home after something that, uh, that, that we were at and I said, I just got to go home and tell Debbie I love her. And, she like, and, and I think I said something else, you know, I was thanking her and she's like, why are you thanking me? <laughs> 
There is a, there's a sense in which we, when we really care about someone, when we really love them, that love and praise, that thanksgiving should just come naturally from us, shouldn't it? And that's what God needs. Why should I thank and praise God? Because I thank and praise Him. Because I love Him. Because I appreciate Him. What kind of press does your life give God? If a news, news person was following you around and they were following you to learn about God by the way you spoke, what would they learn about your God? Does your life give him good press or bad press? If you're doubting his goodness, grumbling about your trials, you're giving God what? Bad press. Those around you won't know what you think about God. Or they'll think, I'm not so sure I want to know this God. By the way, the same thing is true if you're criticizing your church. <laughs> Why would anyone want to come with you to it? If you don't like it, if you don't like its music, its preacher, its facility, its coffee, its goodies, the people that are next to you. I mean, if, if you don't like all that stuff, why would anyone want to come? You know, and then you say, you know, you tell them all this stuff. Or here you are. You're out of the restaurant. You're complaining and criticizing and saying all this bad stuff. And the waitress comes up and he says, hey, why don't you come to our church this week? And she's like, no way. What kind of press are you giving to God? Verse 5 says it this way, For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. The Lord is good. He's not just powerful. He loves us. He's kind and caring. David Guzik said, He is good in his plans, good in his grace, good in his forgiveness, good in his covenant, good in every aspect of his being. He is good. Psalmist goes on, his mercy is everlasting. Folks, if you haven't noted it by now, we're all sinners. We all blow it, sometimes big time. And every single one of us is in need of mercy, not judgment. And frankly, you really don't want justice. You really don't want God to be just with you, to treat you as you deserve. You want him to be merciful, to treat you as you do not deserve. Hebrews says it this way, verse chapter 4, verse 14, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You don't want his justice. You want his mercy. And the other phrase in this last verse is his truth is for all generations. God is true to his promises. He keeps his word. I love the way Corinthians says it. All of the promises are what? Yes, in Christ Jesus. Everything that God has promised us, Jesus says, yes, I'm going to make that promise come true. Yes. See, Spurgeon said, the love of God makes heroes. Give a man a resolve to serve God, and he is endowed with wondrous perseverance. Now think about this. Look at the apostles and martyrs and missionaries of the faith, how they pressed on despite a world in arms. When a nation has been apparently inaccessible, they have found an entrance. When the first missionary has died, another has been ready to follow in his footsteps. The first church in her weakness and poverty and ignorance struggled with philosophy and wealth and all the power of heathen Rome till at the last week of till at last the weak overcame the strong and the foolish overthrew the wise. God's love makes heroes. 
What is it that hinders you from coming to God with thanksgiving? What's in your way? Even as you came this morning, what, what was keeping you from coming into this room and saying, oh God, I'm thankful to be here. God, I thank you for you. I thank you for your love. I thank you for this morning. I thank you for the sky and the clouds. I just thank you for the people around me. I thank you for the colors. I thank you for the fragrances. God, I thank you. What keeps you and what hindered you from giving thanks to God? Could it be that you're looking at circumstances or other people too much? Comparing yourself to them? Or worse yet, are you thinking more about negative things and experiences than thinking about God 